Uh, um, so how much is that? So. Welcome to the podcast editor's mastermind. If you've stumbled upon us by accident, you should probably stick around because we're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to be talking about sales calls and sales processes. And this is something that neither of us are necessarily experts on. So we're going to kind of share what we've got going on. We're going to look for some comments in the chat and we're going to kind of share a little bit about what we're doing. Hopefully we can all grow together. Before we get into that, I'm Brian Entzminger. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. And to my side is... Daniel Abendroth, and you can find me at rothmedia.audio. Now, we should mention, we were uh, talking the last time. We thought that Carrie was going to be able to join us, but it looks like her internet is out again. Either that or she hates us and has decided to ghost us. So you should definitely let her know that you missed her. Before we get into today's topic, we do want to share that this episode is being sponsored by the Podcast Editor Academy. The Podcast Editor Academy is an organization put together by Steve Stewart and Mark Deal. It's a web resource for podcast editors that want to build their businesses. There's a ton of stuff in there. And one thing that kind of stands out to me, because it's relevant to tonight's call, is that the Podcast Editor Academy actually has some sales scripts for like emails and for calls available. So if you're thinking, hey, I'm not quite sure how to get started on this, If you're a member of the Academy, that's one of the resources that comes with that. And even if you don't use them word for word, you can at least use them to go, okay, this is how I might want to structure my call. This is how some things might want to go. And we're very thankful to the Podcast Editor Academy for sponsoring the show. Daniel, did you have anything you wanted to say about that? No, well, I guess, so a colleague of ours, Virginia Elder, I believe she has said this, but I remember like probably a year ago, I saw a post from her who she had mentioned like, she used a sales script and like as soon as she started using like she landed a client like almost immediately. So I'm not saying like these scripts are magic and that they're going to guarantee clients, but definitely gives you like a, a starting point to know kind of where to go. So you can use them as like a building block to kind of give you the confidence and give you a foundation on which to kind of structure your sales calls whenever you're on them. Um, so like in a great, amazing resource that has been proven to be effective. And if you're joining us live and you wanted to find that, you'll find a link in the chat. If you're watching the replay, it's in the chat. Or if you're listening later on the podcast episode, we'll have a link for you in the episode notes so that you can click through and check that out. And I should mention, we've worked out a deal with Mark and Steve where if you join and use the code YETIS, that's Y-E-T-I-S, that will give you a month free of the Podcast Editor Academy to give it a try. See if it's for you, and then that can then you can join up as a paid subscription if it meets your needs. We're pretty confident it will, or we wouldn't be telling you about it. But that's for you because you might want to check it out. It's you know it's a big deal to build your business and have some tools to to help you. So yeah, podcasteditoracademy.com. Now today we're going to talk about sales calls, and I will be honest, this is something that scares me. I'm not a fan of talking to people for the first time or what feels like the first time and in the back of my mind knowing, should I have a better plan? Should I have a better agenda? Any of that kind of stuff. It, it kind of scares me. And transparently, when salespeople say you need to do this and you need to do this and you got to know your numbers and all that stuff, like I don't even have enough volume of sales calls to really know what, my, what a good close rate should be for me. Because as a podcast editor, most of my work is what I would call retainer work where I might bring on a client and they will likely stay with me for two, three, four, five years. So it's not like I have to have a lot of churn in order to keep my business going. So I don't have a ton of sales calls. Uh, Daniel, what's your experience been with sales calls? Uh, Feast and famine. So there'll be times like I'll have three or four potential clients like reach out to me at the same time and hop on these calls. And then like, it won't be anything for a while. But like you said, like in our business, it's not you don't need a high volume of leads in order to be successful because, you know, we work with shows for ideally over the long term. So I would say now I feel pretty comfortable on them, um, but definitely not. I definitely didn't start that way. It was definitely a very uncomfortable experience. Yeah, it's good to know that I'm not the only one. <laughs> so there are so many things that are in the back of my head in terms of calls that I just kind of want to bring out and let people share their thoughts on as well. If you're in the chat, of course, you can comment 
And we may drop those on the screen and comment about those as well. But my first question to you, Daniel, is I'm not sure that my pre-call sequence or the, the process that I use for getting prospects or leads on the phone is super robust. And part of the reason I say that is because I recently had a couple of calls sort of back to back. And both people, when I talked to them and we got to the topic of price, like it's not that we were off by a tiny bit. And it's not like my rates are exorbitant, but they literally had no idea that when I presented them with what a, a year or a season was going to cost them on a monthly basis and then extrapolated out, they didn't know it was going to be that much. And I don't know. I, I'm thinking we were probably off by more than a factor of two, like probably more like a factor of five. And so I'm wondering, like, how do you walk people through this, like the before the call parts to like, do you do anything to help them make it easier? And then also to weed, I don't want to say weed out, but to, to help filter people where it's not a great fit and it's just kind of a waste of everybody's time to get on the phone. I definitely think it's important to have some sort of filtering process. I'm probably in the same boat as you. Mine's not robust. And I haven't honestly given it a whole lot of thought until now. Um, but I say for them, since we don't do a little like advertising, we don't actually have a real marketing plan. New clients almost exclusively come from word of mouth. So the people who are being referred to us where they're being referred by current clients or past clients, if they discussed it, there is an, either like an idea of how much we cost because they've discussed it or they're in like similar levels of their business. So like the cost of our services is probably in line with what they're looking for, if that makes sense. I think we should probably do a better job at that because there have been like, we'll go on a, like a, be on a sales call, a discovery call, whatever you want to call it. And we'll get to the end when we start talking about pricing. And then suddenly it's just like, whoa, we're really excited up to that point. And then like we say our numbers and then they're like completely caught off guard. So I think one thing you can do is be public about your pricing on your website. Though I do go back and forth about that. But if there's any like pre-conversation, any conversation before the sales call, like I'm always very open with our pricing. So if they say, like, how much do you cost? Like, I don't want to be like, here's the exact number because our, my costs vary based on like the services and what you do. But I do try to make it clear ahead of time and like, here's what my what it looked like, just so we don't get on the call with I lost my train of thought. You, you um, share the thoughts or your your rates rather. Yeah. So that so I share the my rates. In the email, so that way they can decide beforehand whether or not we're in line. Interesting. So that's like what I would think a, a, a professional salesperson is tell, would tell us is the exact opposite way you should do it, right? Because yeah. they would say you should have that value proposition conversation before you ever talk price. I've struggled with that as well because by saying, because like I'm not cheap. And so I could potentially scare away clients and I probably have scared away clients with my pricing, but I'd rather scare them away at the beginning because I don't, I hate, I hate sales. I'll just be honest. I was in a sales position. I hated it. I hate it so much. I hate trying to convince people my prices are worth it. It feels kind of sleazy to like talk them into like paying for it and like, because I want to make sure that everybody is happy with it. And so if they're uncomfortable going into it, I'd rather be upfront at the beginning and filter them out that way. Just being like, hey, here's my prices. If it doesn't work for you, like no hard feelings. I'd rather like just get that out of the way and potentially lose a client than try to convince someone on this sales call. Because if my pricing is fine with them before going into the call, I can convince them on the call that like we're the right fit and like the money is not a factor. What I don't want is to hide my pricing, get on the call, and then talk them into working with us if we're outside their budget, because then I'd worry about longevity. Like maybe it's going to be fine for a little while, but like podcasting is a long-term game and I don't want them to be having doubts a couple months into it because I push them into paying more than they're comfortable with. Yeah. And you, you raise an interesting thing because I, I think I take a somewhat similar approach in that I never try to talk someone into doing this. In fact, sometimes I try to talk them out of it. But at the same time, 
there's this tension in my mind because I understand that part of my job is to help them get over fears that they may have that are getting in their way for what they want, right? So I'm not talking about convincing them that they want my services. I'm more talking about helping them sort of address some objections. And I think that ideally some of this would happen on a discovery call, right? So you're having that conversation about uh, why do you want to do this? What does the future look like for you? Like all of those kind of discovery questions that help frame up that future. What I've found is that at least recently with some of the clients or the, the prospects that I've been talking with is it doesn't matter how much they want that end goal. They didn't have a budget. And so it's not to say that anything over zero is too much, but the gap between no budget and what I charge. And again, like my prices are on my website. It's not super expensive. I'm reasonably priced. You know, I'm not on the low end of the market, but I'm also not super premium. And that's not a jump that they were able to make. Maybe it's part of because because I typically do a call and then I send a proposal. Maybe there's a bit of a gap in terms of that communication. I don't know. We could probably talk about some of that. But before we do, I, I do want to bring up Joanne had a couple of comments, said that the same dilemma when she discusses the rate and then step back and ask for a discount or they just say what their budget is. I will say, I don't have a great funnel process or a pipeline, if you will, for for people. If somebody reaches out to me on Facebook, I'll communicate with them on Facebook. If they email me, they'll email me. If they contact me through my website, then I'll do that. Uh, the website actually has a form on it that helps guide people through that, that, that does ask things like, do you have a budget? But I don't force people to go through that. So maybe that's a gap on my my part. I don't ask them at the outset, what's your budget? I feel like while that's a valid question, it doesn't fit my approach. So that's not something that I do. And Joanne again says that same sentiment as you in terms of wanting to meet the client halfway and definitely imagining that what you and Michelle offer is more service, which makes the price tag even higher. And the challenge being that it's not just editing. However, I suspect that sometimes you're able to actually use that to help with your positioning. Like, do you do things when you're presenting yourself to help people position you in your mind differently from other editors that they might be talking to who are, in, in quotes, just an editor? So I mentioned at the top of the episode how I'm way more comfortable now than when I first started in this industry. And I would probably say like 70 to 80 percent of that is because of Michelle having so much. So she's much more comfortable on the calls. So one, having her with me to kind of like balance it out, because then it's not all on me to kind of remember everything, keep things going. I have a partner in that. So I think that definitely helps the flow of the sales call makes us become much more professional, much more confident. But also we can showcase that we are way more than, you know, just editors or, you know, I'm more than just an editor because then we can highlight everything that she brings to it because she's not an editor. She brings like consultation, the strategy, all like the things that you may not think that you need. Because when you start a podcast, like I think the editing aspect is an obvious deficit for most people. Um, most people get into podcasting don't have an audio background. So I think it's clear that like, yeah, I need help with editing. But then we come on being like, boom, well, here's Michelle. Here's all the things that you haven't thought about that she helps with. But I think that definitely does set us up, set us apart from other people. You mentioned Michelle being a value added service. And that's certainly, I mean, I, that's certainly the case. I'm wondering, as you think about this call, how do the two of you prepare? Like, do you just book a call and then hop on and start asking questions? Or do you do something before? before you actually get on the call? We don't do a whole lot, especially with our free consultation. You know, we're not making money on it. So we don't want to like go too much into researching our client or, the, you know, the prospect and all the things that we can do for them because it's just like, it's not worth our time. So we do everything like on the call. We might like look up their website, see what they do, get an idea of who they are and get a feel for them. But we don't do a whole lot of preparation. Because our discovery call is pretty straightforward. We'll start off. So it's a 30 minute call. The first 15 minutes is us talking or asking the prospect who they are, what their idea is, why they want to podcast, getting more information about what they're looking for. And then like the second half is us talking about who we are, what we offer and all that. So I guess like we have a structure already 
that's kind of a pretty solid like template, I guess. Um, but we don't do like per call. We don't really do much extra work. Interesting. Yeah. So I've actually, after talking with the the coach that I've been working with in the process of changing my, my process, and this is going to be similar to what I did when I was, when I was actually bringing on somebody to handle quality control. I don't know if you remember in one of our private calls, we talked about how I had set up a process for that in terms of helping to screen people. What this coach recommended and what he does is the first call you'll get on with pretty much anybody that wants to. And it's like a 10 to 15 minute call that consists of like, tell me a little bit about your show. Tell me what you want to accomplish. Why do you think like that kind of stuff, some really basic stuff. And then they leave that and we set an additional appointment. And then between the first appointment and the second appointment, I give them some homework to do, something to do. And it's something along the lines of like, have you visited my portfolio page to see what kind of work we do? If it's, if it's a new launch, it's going to be a couple of things around audience definition, like a couple of things that'll add value, whether they work with us or work with me or not, because they'll be able to take that and go, okay, I know my audience better. I know my topic, like a couple of those things that I just give them to do. But then it becomes a little bit of a test. Like if we're working together, are they going to listen to me? Are they going to do, I mean, it's not like I'm trying to control them. But if they're going to hire me as an expert and they're going to pay me, then I'm going to hope that they're going to listen as well. And then when that's complete, then of course we can have that longer, like 30 to 60 minute call where then, and this is the part that I need to continue fleshing out is like that process of gathering more in terms of like, what is, what does success really look like to you? What's keeping you from success? That like some of those general discovery type things. And then what is working together look like for you? Because I have some ideals on my side, but that doesn't mean that I'd be serving them well. So that's that's a process I'm working on implementing. It's not where I'm at yet. But I will say that after having put in quite a number of learning experiences on a 30-minute call, I am really interested in having a little bit of pain gain share in terms of like getting that process built out so that when we come back for a second call, we really know what we're talking about. And there's a much higher probability of coming out of that with an agreement. So do you have like a second call before they sign on? Yeah. The second call would be, okay, let's talk money now. And what I've been doing is first call is 30 minutes. I send them a proposal. They tell me that was too much. I say, are you sure? Do you want to talk about... Like after five emails, they say, actually, I, I didn't think it was going to be that much. And then they go away, right? And I, I want to sort of nip that part in the bud. And I want to be able to ha- be having a conversation with them where I have a general understanding of what they're looking for so I can work up some basic pricing. And then based on the discovery call, we can, you know, I can either say, you know, if my pricing is right for what they want, then we can do that. Otherwise I can say, okay, well, you know, based on this conversation, it looks like I've got some more things I understand differently now, but what I'd like to do is, you know, get you a proposal and then we can talk about how we can potentially work together. But I feel like just giving up on the one call is kind of shortchanging everybody. And making that first call the long one, I think is maybe not the best process, at least for me. I don't even know if I know how you do your pricing. Is it custom for each client? Typically, it's not super customized, but okay. there are options. And if, for example, I thought that they were going to do a weekly show and they're actually like, well, it's actually you know, twice a month. Well, that's going to change the rate, but in a way that I can pretty quickly address. Okay. So I guess my question is, why don't you kind of lay out the pricing on that first call? Initially, it's been because that first call is the long discovery call where I'm going, okay, is this even the right fit? And I don't usually approach that with a proposal for them. And honestly, I don't know, maybe I don't need proposals, but that's always felt more professional to me to send them something that says, this is what what we're talking about. And maybe it's fear. Like, let's just be real. Like, yes, I've latched onto something that has been a process and I'm moving toward a different process. But yeah, maybe there's some fear. I have thought about putting on my initial email, like, hey, we're going to meet in a couple of days. Uh, by the way, pricing my pricing typically starts around here. Maybe that's worthwhile. I would think so. So I, I guess where I would differ is I pricing is probably the biggest reason why I would m- lose out on a potential client because my pricing doesn't match their budget. And mm-hmm. I would rather get that out in the open first before I invest too much time into it. And maybe not even like, here's like the final number. Because like you said, like there's there's a lot of factors, you know, if they're weekly versus every other week versus monthly or whatever, what services they get. 
but at least have an idea of what they'll be paying. So then they can de- decide early on if it's even worth pursuing, you know, because I don't want to spend like waste a couple hours figuring out like if we're a good fit, if like the pricing isn't a match right. from the get go. So I, I think you mentioned that you typically send them something before the call and then you actually talk pricing on the call, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have any flexibility in your packages? Yeah. So if my base package is for one episode a week, up to 60 minutes of raw audio. And then that includes like if a month has five episodes, they get that fifth one for free. But that's kind of like the baseline. So if they only do an episode every other week, then I have a discount for that. And if their episodes are like in the 15 minute or shorter range, they pay less for that as well. And I lay that all out. So I, I'm clear about like what it covers. So that way, if they come back to me and be like, hey, I'm only going to doing, you know, two episodes a month, then I can be like, okay, well, here's the price for that as well. But I, and I don't share, like I don't send the pricing unless they ask for it. So if they ask, like if they want to know ahead of the call, then that tells me that their budget is probably questionable. Because if you're going to ask how much something is, then you probably have like a little bit of fear about it being too much. Whereas like if you're, if you, do, if you have a large budget, you're less concerned about the pricing. That makes sense. So if they are asking about pricing ahead of time, like I want to be sure to be like, let them know what it is so we can move on if it's not a fit from that point. And I don't have to, we don't all have to waste our time hopping on a 30 minute call if it's not going to work out. I may change my process. I, uh, I'm slow to change, as you know, but there's, <laughs> there's also that. And also, if you're not having a large number of sales calls, making these changes is difficult because you don't have, it's hard to A-B test or like see a difference if you don't have the volume to test it out on. Okay, yeah. So when uh, people book with you, like how do you handle the, the booking process? Do you use tools? Like what, what do you do in terms of getting the actual meeting set up? Got an AppSumo deal for a website called Meet Fox. So even if I didn't have a lifetime deal, it's something I would pay monthly for. It's a combination of like Google Calendar, Calendly, and Zoom. I can put an embed on my website. They can pick the date, time, everything from there. It adds it to my Google Calendar and sends them the confirmation email, sends them a reminder email, and it has a video chat built in. So that way I don't have to send them like a Zoom link or anything. It's all taken care of. Everything's on Meet Fox. Um, so they can book the call themselves and I don't have to like admin anything. And it also integrates with my Google Calendar. So if I have something booked on my calendar, like, so I'm going to be traveling this weekend, I can put that in my calendar and it automatically blocks off that time through Meet Fox. My process is relatively similar. And if, if you're listening and you want to share in the chat, definitely interested in what you do as well. Typically, if somebody reaches out to me and they haven't already booked, because I do have a booking service, I use Book Like a Boss because I got a lifetime deal on that and then it integrates with Zoom. But if somebody emails me, typically what I'll do if they want to set up a call is I'll say, I'll look at my calendar and I'll say, hey, as of right now, I have these two time slots available and I'll send them two and say, would one of those work for you? And if not, you can use this link to find something that works for you. Because I feel like and maybe this is a shortcoming of mine, but I feel like that first interaction with them in terms of booking, I want to make that as much a hand-holding or white glove experience as I can. Because occasionally when I get those kinds of things, I think I don't have time to pull up my calendar right now and go look at your calendar and work all this stuff out. So I like to provide a couple of options for them to just quickly go, yeah, that works. Make them feel like hopefully that they're super valuable uh, because I know yours are valuable as well, but I like to try and make them feel that way in a little bit different way. I will say that it does add time, right? Because I have to find a couple of slots that work. And then also I have the added complexity of not typically being available during business hours. And so a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm finding a couple of slots on my calendar that are within the normal workday where I believe that I can be free and available so I can block that time and not take away from my day job. And then if those don't work, then they're welcome to find something in non-standard time. Yeah, I will say that I'm fortunate and being able to do this full time that frees up my schedule tremendously. I know it's a completely different story whenever I had a full time job because I couldn't have calls during normal business hours when most people are free. I guess a lot of people, the clients that I work with, are probably free during that time. So, yeah, it's easier for me to kind of be more open with it. 
But that does bring up, because right now, either they schedule on their own or they send me an email being like, hey, you know, so-and-so recommended you. I'd love to hop on a call or whatever. And then I have like a little bit of email being like, hey, great to connect. Pretty much like, here's a link to my calendar. Pick a time that works for you. We'll hop on a call and we'll kind of go over everything. And then like Meet Fox will send like the reminder email and everything. So I don't have to worry about that. But I am wondering if I should add something to that process ahead of time. Just another stepping, like another point of contact to make them feel more valuable or more important. Just being like, hey, I'm looking forward to the call. Here's some information or whatever. Kind of like what you said, like, I guess the homework you give them after the first call, like check out my portfolio, whatever. Maybe do something like that. Just like another little bit of like another email, just like kind of connecting on a more personal level. And I should share that part of this is modeled based on how I used to handle interviews when I was setting them up for the first show that I had. Because a lot of times I would have people that would book two, three, four weeks out from when their interview was. And so I wanted to have a series of lightly value added emails to send them as reminders. I was over communicating, but not in an, hey, don't forget kind of way. (laughs) And so I could have the first email would be like something like, hey, I saw that we're booked, really looking forward to it. It's going to be great. The second email would be like, hey, I made this quick video because I know that meeting on the internet is kind of impersonal. Here's some questions you might want to think about. The third one, like, and I, I kind of went through that process. And so I try to do a very short version of that when it comes to the the booking things in terms of like getting stuff set up. I don't do a great job with that interim step. So that's that's a gap that you helped me identify right here. Yeah. Need to talk to Michelle to kind of fill that in. <laughs> so when you hop on a call, like are you are you following a script? Like, do you have a general process? How, how do you handle that? I we don't have a script, but we do just like have a general outline. So like I mentioned before, we kind of introduce ourselves. And then like the first half of it is getting information from them about what they're looking for, because that can kind of shape what we offer. So if they're saying like, I want to do a podcast, I'd have no idea about anything beyond that. Like I know my topic and that's it. Then we know I'm being like, okay, well, here's like everything we offer. Here's our massive launch process. Here's like all the stuff. Already have a podcast or whatever. Like we can have a better idea of what they're looking for. So we can kind of tailor off like what we're communicating. So if they've already launched and we don't need to sell our launch package because it's not useful to them. I, I never really thought about it. We do keep it kind of like fun and friendly. So like a lot of the time, like our cat will hop on my desk or like our dog will make something. So we just kind of like be more personal about it. If that makes sense. Yeah. And that's, that's something. So I've tried using scripts or frameworks in the past and honestly, they feel really forced to me. Yeah, kind of cold, robotic. Right. And there's a part of me that wants that structure because I understand that by following the process of having them help you define what success looks like and what happens, it's like all of that kind of stuff. I understand that's really useful in the sales journey, both for you and also for them, right? Because I don't want to name any shows, but somebody reached out to me recently who's been editing a show for quite some time and just was a, wanted to bring on an editor. And so part of my job, if I had done it really well, was to help her understand not just, okay, you've got this pain and I can help you address this pain, but also like, why do you want to have this pain addressed? Editing is taking you a long time. And this is my failure. So, I mean, you get to walk, like we never talked about in three to five years, what would success look like if we were working together and everything worked according to your best, like your magic wand wish we never talked about that. We never talked about, okay, you're getting back 10 hours a week of your, or 10 hours every two weeks because it was a bi weekly show. We never talked about what are you getting back on that. So I did a ridiculously bad of setting the value proposition because what I was trying to do was hear her passion for her show and what she wanted to do, but I didn't go deep enough. And so while it's possible that I never would have closed that deal, right, because the gap was pretty significant, it's also possible that the gap was more significant because we never talked about the opportunity cost of not bringing me in. And for a business, like a show that's run by a business, it's much easier to have the opportunity cost because you just go, well, as the CEO or the founder of your business, what's your time worth? 300 bucks an hour? Okay, how long does it take you to do this? Oh, 10 hours. So is it worth $3,000 an episode for you to do this? Well, what if I could do that for a tenth of that? Like, Because it's really easy for us to think of it in terms of 
what are you hoping to gain out of this? But also there's the part of it, if you did it yourself, what would it cost you to do it? Does me being able to do it for less, and, and I don't mean like how much would you pay, but like if your time is worth 300 bucks an hour, mine's not, but if it was, what is the cost of you doing this versus us? And I did not do that, right? And so that's, that's again, a gap on my part. Do you feel that prospects you talk to aren't convinced to hire somebody and you have to sell them on the idea of hiring an editor? Or is it just like they've decided that they need somebody and it's between you or other editors? I think sometimes it's between me or other editors. I think sometimes it's, I really want an editor. Oh, that's how much they cost? Or, you know, and I don't want to be disparaging, right? Because this is a little bit of assumption because like I said, we didn't do the part about like, what other solutions have you looked at? Right? Because that's part of the framework that I wasn't using. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably off topic. So anyway, I thought it just popped in like for, because we're, well, we had this idea for years now, but it's something we're finally kind of like looking to implement is having like a three part, like a three tier offering. So like our top tier is our one-on-one services, what you would imagine like that we offer, like the whole shebang. And then like the step down from that is like a course or like paid process that guides them on how to do it themselves. And then like the free tier, it's just like our blog posts, YouTube content. If we, we thought about like doing a podcast, so like the free tier for people that just want to completely do, do it themselves. So I'm wondering if that would make sense for you to have like that second tier of like a course or a self-guided process that they can pay for that you offer. So, so that way it meets their budget. And as they go through with it, they can see, wow, how much more valuable it would be to hire Brian. And also like when they get to that point in their budget, who else are going to go to than the guy that helped them along the way? You know, you, you raised an interesting point because I do have a course. It's specific to using Hindenburg. It's not like, it's not overall podcast editing. It's how to work with the software. But that's a gap that I missed because In the case of at least one of the shows, part of the problem was that the host wasn't comfortable with the software that was being used. And so something that's optimized for dialogue editing could have been a win for her. Now, whether or not it would have been, but I I totally missed the downsell on that one. And again, we're just talking about failures today, (laughs) apparently. I I do want to touch on what Alejandro Mm -hmm. put in the comments. if that's okay. Did you have something else before we go into that? No. Okay. So Alejandro's, uh, and for those who don't know, Alejandro is the editor for us for this show. So he's hopped in and he's got some questions. He says that talking for money always makes him feel anxious, but also the call makes him feel anxious. Can you imagine if it's both of them, apart from getting professional therapy, any (laughs) advice for somebody who suffers with the same thing I do? And I don't know, Daniel, do you have any ideas other than professional therapy? (laughs) I can definitely imagine the mix of both because that's what I went through. I don't know like how to help get to this point, but you have to be confident in your pricing. So when I, early on, I would negotiate against myself because I didn't see, I mean, I suffer from imposter syndrome like so many people, and I didn't believe in the value of what I was offering. So I was hesitant about throwing out my pricing because I'm like, oh, they'll never go for that. So then I, I, I throw out a lower number and hoping that that's fine for them. So like even before I give them the price, I'm already negotiating against myself, getting it lower and lower on their behalf. So you really just had to go in um, confident in your pricing and knowing that like what you're charging is worth the money. But essentially, like if you don't get this client it's okay because then it's easier to throw out the large number that you're scared of. Because if you know that if you're confident in your pricing, then like if they don't appreciate, like if, they, if there's too much for them, then like they're not the right clients. I would say that part of it, and I'm by no means an expert, sales calls still make me uncomfortable. Generally, just hopping on Zoom to talk to somebody about their podcast or if somebody's hired me for consulting, that is super comfortable. But when I feel like I'm hopping on a call where I have to prove my worth, that feels uncomfortable to me. And while I won't say that I've got it all nailed down, I would say that it's gotten easier as I've done it. Same thing happened when I published my first podcast episode. 
where I was afraid that everybody I knew was going to listen to it, which didn't happen, by the way. Almost nobody I knew listened to it, but I was afraid that they would listen to it and then they, they would judge me, either for the content or the production value or whatever. Now I look back on myself and I judge me for sure, but <laughs> that's a different issue. It got easier. And you know, doing one a week for the first three years or whatever, and then every other week for a couple more years, after a while, it became more, I'm actually comfortable behind the, the microphone. I, I remember watching, this is going to be related, I remember watching a YouTube creator talk about like, what should you do for the first 100 videos? He's like, the first 12 to 20 of full effort videos, you're, you're going to do your very best. Those are throwaway. You're going to do them. You're going to publish them. They're going to be terrible. That's okay. You're just getting your feet under you. I would say the same thing is probably true of sales calls, although I still feel like I'm on my first three having had a bunch more. So, you know, kind of take that with a grain of salt. I don't know, Daniel. Yeah, definitely. The more you do it, the easier it gets and the more confident you can feel, especially once you start getting some yeses to use it to be confident in your pricing. But I'm wondering if it does make sense to like kind of the approach that Brian was talking about. The first call is just discovery and then you can send the proposal afterwards. So that way, it, for me, it's easier to discuss something through email than it is on like a video chat or something. So I'm wondering if it would make sense at the beginning, hop on that call, figure out what they're looking for, but don't give them solid pricing. Just, um, they ask about it, be like, um, I want to make sure that I get you accurate pricing. So I'm going to take all this, come up with a proposal, and then I'll email that to you and we can discuss it then. So that way you're taking the money, at least part of that anxiety, out of that equation. And then you can, even if you even if you don't need to come up with a proposal because you have like structured pricing, you don't need to communicate that to be like, I want to like come with a proposal based on what you're looking for. I'll email that and then we can go from there. Because like once you send that email, like it's done, it's out of your hands. So you can't kind of second guess yourself on that. I don't know, Brian, what do you think? I think that can help. I will say that I feel like part of the reason I've struggled is because I have sent proposals by email rather than providing them immediately before an actual booked call. Uh, and I've done that in the past, feeling like I'm being respectful, but I suspect that I would get more and better feedback if I was actually walking through the proposal with the person while I'm on the call with them. Okay, so instead of like sending an email and being like, hey, let's talk about it, schedule another call and then send it to them right Okay. That's where this two, two-step two process comes in. If I do have really structured pricing and we've already gotten enough information for me to know that it's going to match with what it is, then I would feel confident if I have that second one set up to maybe email them the proposal an hour earlier just in case there's a problem with screen sharing and just say, hey, okay, here's the deal. Like This is what we talked about. I sent you the proposal. Um, I typically send them two to three options. I'll send them one that's exactly what they offered or they asked for. And then I'll typically send them one that's a little bit less expensive for fewer services and one that's a little bit more. And then we can talk about, you know, this is what you're asking for, but then I'm going to provide you a couple of options in case there's something that fits your need better than what we understood it to be. So yeah. And Alejandro said it's a good thing that he's not the only one. I cringe thinking back to like the early days. So I just know like it'll get better. Um, You said to stick to it. So um, we've talked a little bit about people saying no. How do you deal with objections? Typical objections being, you know, it's too expensive. Your turnaround time is too slow. How do I know that you can do the job? Like, how do you deal with those? Don't know that I've had many that I can combat. Because like, so I actually got an email earlier today um, from somebody we talked to a while back who was going to go with another direction because they, the other person offers more services than we do. So like, I mean, there's nothing we can really do about that. But if, it, if it's, if it's based on pricing, then I can offer fewer services. So I won't discount my services, but I can be like, Hey, you know, if you want to do every other week, you know, I'll charge less for that. If you want to do like shorter episodes, I can charge for less for that, that kind of thing. Or maybe you write your own show notes rather than have us do it or something like that. If it, as far as like whether or not I can do it, that's never really been an issue because I don't know if prospects just understand like they're not, it's not worth their time. They're not good at it. And they just trust that I can do it. But I've never really had to kind of prove myself. And if I did, I mean, like there's not a whole lot I can do. 
other than being like, here's the shows I work on, listen and see if you like it. But I feel like if I had to like convince them I'm good enough, then they're not really my ideal clients. I'm actually glad that we talked about this because as you were talking, I was reminded that we know somebody who has a different model, Mike from editorcore.com. His process is there are no prices on his website and his website says, you want a price? Cool. I can't tell you what that is until we know what we're dealing with because, and as an editor, you know this, but I'm going to take it from the manufacturing world. The quality of the ingredients and the reliability of the ingredients, in this case being the audio that's provided by your clients, will dictate the amount of processing that's required to turn it into the final spec, assuming it's even possible. And so his approach is, give me 15 minutes. I'll do 15 minutes for free. I'll send it back to you. I'll have a feel for what, you know, what your show is going to be like and what it's like to edit your show. You'll have a feel for what I can do. And then we can talk about pricing, which I think is a pretty brilliant approach. It's not something that I've done because transparently, I don't have time to do 15 minutes for free for every <laughs> potential person that I pop, hop on the call with. And part of the deal for me is because I'm an evenings and weekends kind of editor, if I have a sales call, that means that that's 30 minutes to an hour that's now gone from my production schedule. I can't add on top of that. By the way, I'm also going to edit 15 minutes for free just to have that call. But I, that's something that I would like to implement because I think it the feedback that I get from the clients is, I don't know how you made it sound like that. And I want to be able to provide that experience for people before we talk about pricing so that it's not just like, this is going to save me 10 hours a week, but also this is going to deliver a thing that I literally cannot do myself. I think where I differ is that like I'm not really selling like my editing skills. I'm selling like, the podcast, like their ability to have a podcast. So it's more like I'm selling like who we are as opposed to what I can do. I mean, maybe I should have referred the people that I had calls with to you. I don't know. They might've gone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cause you've got Michelle and I don't have a Michelle. Yeah. I have a person who does help me with some of the quality control and social media scheduling, but I don't have a social media strategist on staff. Cause that's, that's pretty much where she sits is your your brand and your media strategist in terms of working with your clients and helping them with content strategy. I don't have one of those. And while I can do it, I mean, Michelle just opens her mouth and genius things come out. I have to actually think about it, right? right. So <laughs> it, it's totally in her wheelhouse. And so it's perfect that you guys offer that. So I, like, I'm starting to think, you know, yeah, I, t- I totally refer away probably half of the people that contact me because I think there's somebody better. In this case, maybe I missed it on those. I don't know. I mean, I hate giving away business, but at the same time, I don't want to waste their time if I know that I'm not the best person for them. Has that been a deal breaker for your prospects? They can't do all these other things? Not typically, but I always think, hey, if I could, is there something else I could have offered them? Right. So as it stands right now, I can't necessarily offer them growth. I can't offer them a growth strategy. What I can offer them is a podcast that, assuming they give me at least mediocre audio, can sound pretty darn good. And if they give me great audio, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to sound good, right? I can offer them that. But what I can't do is say, I'm going to help you 10x your show because that's not a skill set that I have. And it's not really a skill set I'm interested in developing right now. I'm interested in providing them the frameworks for them to do it themselves in terms of like engaging their listeners and those kind of things. But it's not something where I can say, look, I'm a Hall of Fame podcaster or her, hey, look, you know, I turned down a deal from Spotify or what like is I don't have that in my toolkit. What I do have is I produce really good audio and I've got some frameworks that can help you, but I'm not going to take over your relationship with your listeners. That's you. I want to touch on Steve's comment. I like Mike's idea. While then from the start, the payoff is a client, which is a nice size payoff. The issue will come down from people who haven't started recording. They'll want help learning to record. I'm wondering if we should have if this is another topic, because like, I'm kind of like on the other side of things, or I guess like on the other side of this idea and like the clients can't tell good audio from great audio that I work with. So I, I guess like my proposition isn't in like audio quality. It's not having to do all the things for your podcast. I don't know. I feel like this could be another topic. Yeah. And, and that's a, that's a good push, right? Because your value proposition doesn't have to be the same as mine. Right. Yeah, that's right. 
And you've invested your time in developing your skill set in the things that serve the customers that you want to serve. And I've invested mine because I like learning. I don't know, because <laughs> I like uh, things that give us that last little bit of <laughs> results, right? I've got way too many compressors because I've just got, I've got an issue with that. And it could like be the difference between like clients. Cause like, I'll admit it, you're a better editor than I am. Like your engineering skills are on another, diff- another level. So yeah, we're offering kind of different things to potentially different clients. And Steve's comment about having a before and after sample, definitely good. Yeah. I do have a portfolio page. I don't do the before and afters. And part of the reason I don't is because in my view, those can be faked. And maybe it's not 15 minutes. I have an interest to maybe do five minutes. Like, give me five minutes and let's see what we can do. And then it might be something like, hey, you gave me five minutes. I gave you back four minutes. Want to hear what those other that other minute was, <laughs> right? <laughs> or whatever the answer is. And I'm not trying to like d- define that, but that's that's my thought. One other question, and this one is one that I don't have a great answer for. Usually, it, the question is, how can you tell if it's a good client? And typically, the way I know it's not a good client is because at the outset, I already feel like there's not a great fit either with the show or the personalities. Or when I give them the pricing, they say no. And at that point, I'm pretty sure they're not a good client. <laughs> but I don't know. How about you? So is this before we sign on? Like, I guess yeah, during I think the sales before. process. I mean, once you've signed on, you know they're not because they continue to behave like right. not a good client. But So I kind of what you mentioned, if the pricing doesn't work out, then obviously not a good fit. And on the call, so I guess if their priorities don't match, so like what you're saying, like you don't offer growth. So if that's what they're looking for, then like I'm, we're not a good fit because I can't help them with that. Or if they want, like, if they have expectations I can't meet. So if they want 24-hour turnaround or, you know, three hour-long episodes a week, probably not a good fit for me. Yeah. And I guess I have a couple of those too, right? Because I work a day job, if they want somebody who's available for random phone calls throughout the day with, with no notice, I'm not their guy. And I actually, like, when I hop on a call, usually within that first call, I'm saying, okay, just by the way, for a few people, this has been an issue. I just want you to know, I am building a podcast business. I am a professional editor. I also have a full-time job. If that's an issue, that's fine. But I want that to be out there first. I don't want there to be any misunderstanding about what I'm offering because I am a professional, but I'm not available from nine to five, Monday through Friday. And Joanne loves the discussion. So Joanne, we appreciate you being here. We'd love to have more ideas, more thoughts about what you are your ideas as well. Uh, Daniel, did you have anything else on this one? I think that we've covered things pretty well. Yeah, I don't, Nothing's coming to mind. I think I'm good. Cool. Uh, One thing I did want to mention, we're still working on it, so no guarantees, but our plan is for the next live stream to bring somebody on who actually is an expert in sales calls or sales emails, like that kind of thing, to help us kind of walk through making our stuff better. And so we are hopeful that you'll join us. If you haven't already, just connect with the uh, Podcast Editor Mastermind Facebook page, and then also go to podcasteditorsmastermind.com and sign up for our email newsletter. We typically send out one email every two weeks that says something like, hey, we're going live and this is what we're going to talk about. We don't send a bunch of emails about all kinds of spammy stuff, but we would recommend that you do that. That's podcasteditorsmastermind.com because we really want to see you here. And I don't know, Daniel, did I miss anything? Um, If you want to be a guest, just go to podcasteditorsmastermind.com slash be a guest. And the genius that Brian is, he solved the issue of Everything go into my spam folder. So now it goes to our Slack channel. So we won't miss your miss your request. And actually, one I'm excited about, Cam from No Tracks is looking to come on the show. So I'm excited to talk to him in the future about No Tracks and how to kind of share, communicate like edits and whatnot with clients, with contractors, whatever. So if you are an expert and have something you want to share, or if you're an editor that needs help, Podcast editor is mastermind.com slash be a guest and we'll get you on the show. And because the mark of every good podcast is at least four calls to action at the end. <laughs> I also want to just say that we did recently update our website. So if you haven't been there in a minute, uh, just go check it out. We think it looks pretty cool. It's totally different design. We did some stuff to simplify it and I think it looks really pretty, but I'm also the one that did it. So <laughs> if you don't like it, it's uh, Daniel's fault. <laughs> there you go. That's fair. Daniel, do we have time for the pod deck question of the day? Yeah, I got time. All right. I need a number from one to five. I do have pod deck cards right here. Let's go with number one. Number one. 
If you've joined us in the, the chat, of course, you're welcome to share your answer as well. The question is, if there was a sandwich named after you, what would be on it? So this is the Daniel Avendroth. Oh, so, okay. So I'm going to have barbecue sauce because I love barbecue sauce. Um, beef, cheese, onion. I don't know. This is a weird question. <laughs> It is, but it's great. So mine, the Brian Entsminger, is not a sandwich that I, well, really ever have anymore. But back when I used to work in a fast food restaurant, I had a couple of people from Mexico that also worked for me. They made the most amazing jalapeno salsa. And the thing that I most liked was a sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit with tomato and jalapeno salsa. I know it sounds ridiculous. It was Unbelievable. It was just super good. So yeah, I'd recommend that. Steve says, peanut butter and honey on Wonder Bread, the soft, white, American kind. So that's great. <laughs> Daniel, anything else to add? No, I think I'm good. Cool. Well, in that case, for those of you that joined us live, thank you so much. We appreciate the conversation, the insights, the questions. We really want this show to be valuable for you. And the easiest way for that to happen is for you to show up and share your voice so that we can make that part of our conversation. And for those of you that have caught us later, you know we, we still appreciate you. We understand that not everybody's in the t- same time zone. And for those where it's two in the morning, we're sorry. We just can't change the way the sun goes around the earth or you know the spinny thing. So there's that. I've been Brian Ensminger. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. And with me is... Daniel Abendroth. You can find me at rothmedia.audio. And unfortunately, our fellow Yeti could not join us because squirrels destroyed her internet. Carrie Caulfield, Eric, and you can find her at yayapodcasting.com. So that's all we've got for you. Thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Um, So, How much is that? (laughs) Um, 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 I hit stop. Nice. (laughs) On the first try.